Hello, welcome to The Rest is History. Now, once again, we are in London. Tom Holland has wrote me into one of his exciting walking tours <laughs> of our nation's capital. But this time, it's a tour with a bit of a difference, because, Tom, we're doing hidden London, the secrets of London. Very exciting. Well, what I thought was, I, I mean, one of the things about London, it, it's an unbelievably historic city. Um, but there are lots of places where the history is kind of hidden. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, when you know what went on, when you have a sense of, of the kind of the ghosts that haunt it. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems with London is that although it's an incredibly historic city, um, there are many of the most historic corners of it where the history isn't really visible. Yeah. So you have a track record, um, the Christmas Carol podcast, the Roman London podcast, of dragging me to what appear to be <laughs> very yes. banal corners of the city outside branches of coffee shops yeah. and um, loss adjusters offices and things like that and to be frank that's where we are again we're at a yeah. big junction the old bailey now the old bailey is very historic yes the old the old bailey which is the great courthouse is nearby there's a church i know you love a church so i imagine uh, that's and Hoban play. Viaduct. But so, the exciting thing for me is that i don't know where we're going <laughs> exactly it's a mystery well, tour so so um over the course of the lockdown um, you know, you could only go out uh, and have exercise if you went from door and out and then back to your door. Yeah. So we, I, we just ended up doing loads and loads of walks. And I increasingly themed them kind of around aspects of London history. So we did, um, we did Roman London. We did medieval London. We did Tudor London. We did the ghosts of London. We did Dickens's London. Um, all kinds of different themes. And I've brought you to the area of the city that had the most intersections. So if you imagine them as ley lines, this was the kind of the spaghetti junction right. of, of London nice. psychogeographical walks. And I as can't you wait say, for our Chipping Norton walk, Tom. <laughs> as you say, Dominic, it, it doesn't look, it's not particularly picturesque. No. It's very, but, very unappealing. Frankly. But, so we, we, did, um, we, we did a walk of Roman London. We did. And talked about the wall. We are on the site of one of the, the, the gates in the Roman wall. And this was Newgate. Uh, and according to our old friend John Stowe, the Elizabethan antiquarian, um, yeah, it was called Newgate because it was built in the reign of either Henry I or, or Stephen, so uh, in the Norman period. Was in fact the Newgate? He was wrong. Um, oh. He was wrong because it is in fact a Roman gate. Uh, and from here, the road went, it's Watling Street that goes up to, um, to basically to, to the Cotswolds, to your... Oh, yes. the oh, so uh, if you just dream. keep yeah, you just keep heading along Hoban Viaduct, you get back home. So that's what, so Tom. For those people who don't know London, we are still within the walls of that. Well, just by the walls of the city. Yes. So it's, so the so the Roman Wall marks the line of the city of London pretty much. Um, so we are just on the edge of the city, and I think one of the reasons why um, this area of London is that we're going to go and look. So we're going to to, to go north, away from the line of of the, the Roman Wall is that the stuff that went on just outside the city wall is incredibly interesting. So that's part of what we're Splendid. going to look at. But, but just a, a bit on, on Newgate. Newgate, of course, is famous yeah. as the prison. Of course. So yeah. um, there, was, there was a kind of prison here from, from the end of the 12th century right the way up to... So 1902, big, 1902 that surprises me yeah. that it went so long. Because it's sort of a very Dickensian image, doesn't it? Absolutely, Newgate yes, yes. And so... Um, a vast kind of criminal complex and the fact that the the old bailey is there we, you've got um the golden statue of justice with her yeah you know blindfolded with the the sword and the the scales of justice um is a is a reminder of the fact that this was the site where people were arrested chucked into prison um and in fact opposite us where we're standing now there is a pub called the viaduct tavern yes i was just eyeing up that pub and in the basement, yep. where they store the beer... You're a great man for a London basement, Tom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. Well, there are no Roman ruins here, sadly. Um, but there are, there are um, surviving cells in which debtors were kept. And... Uh, wow. So can they're you... down, down in the basement. So if you're ever having a drink in the Viaduct Tavern, you can ask, go down and ask the landlord, go and have a look. And, and um, there is apparently still um, a condemned man's cell on the far side... Um, you'd be kept in that slightly larger because... Of you the get, Old Bailey. Yeah, of the Old Bailey. So you get loads of, of visitors. People who want to see someone who's about to be hanged. Yes, of course. Um, and then you'd be led along a, a tapering corridor so it would get narrower and narrower and narrower as you got to the gallows. <laughs> <laughs> in case you kind of, you know, as a, as the prisoner, you'd you'd have a panic and try and run away. Um, so they would execute people on on site. 
Well, so the, the main um, execution site for a lot of the period was Tyburn Hill, which is yeah. now Marble Arch. That's what I was and um, Hoban Viaduct, you keep going on, it ends up becoming Oxford Street. So you'd be put on a tumbril and you'd be taken all this kind of about three miles uh, and people would line and, and cheer and it'd all be a great holiday, great fun. Um, that changed in 1783. Right. And we're next to a church and yes. basically this space here so there's a kind of uh, the, the church is called brilliantly saint sepulcher without newgate so outside newgate so we're outside the city walls here um this is where the gallows were and it was a, a you know a huge um huge spectacle so dickens came here to see it thackeray came yeah, to see an execution so. I- um Dickens' and, uh, descriptions of going to see executions. When I mean, Dickens had a real fascination for executions, didn't he? He, he, he saw one in Rome, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he did. Um, well, especially to see it. Um, but uh, a, a kind of legacy of that is that inside, um, inside the church, inside St. Sepulchre without Newgate, there is um, an executioner's bell, which was endowed by uh, a pious merchant in 1604. So it would sound whenever an execution was due to be held. And um, oh, to summon the locals, yes, to summon the locals, and um, these verses would be chanted Prepare you for tomorrow, you will die. Watch all and pray. The hour is drawing near that you before the Almighty must appear. Examine well yourselves in time's repent that you may not to the eternal flames be sent. Well, I'd like to hear that before I'm executed. <laughs> exactly. So, um, I think that's that's all kind of very uh, invigorating and inspiring. Um, and the other invigorating, inspiring aspect of this corner is that here we have London's oldest uh, water fountain. Yeah, drinking I've been inspecting fountain. this. So this is a. Um, it says the first metropolitan public drinking fountain erected on Hoban Hill in 18. What is that? 39, um, and removed when the viaduct was constructed in 18. 18- 67. So there are two cups here still. Two cups, but no water, sadly. No. Um, so this so is sort of classic Victorian public service engineering, isn't it, the yes. water fountain? Yes, and it's the conjunction of, of gallows and um, temperance movement that is very, very Victorian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so some people presumably will be, getting, will be coming here to watch the execution and getting absolutely tanked up. Yeah. And they're putting water here to, you know, yeah, to try calm and, down. To try and regulate it. Yeah. So, so that's Newgate. So it's a kind of, um, you know, you could you know walk along here and have no sense of it but i think once you feel it maybe i'm being over romantic i think uh, think you know the sense of um of misery and oppression does slightly ooze up out of the out of the tarmac maybe i'm right in thinking tom that this is where some tudor in the tudor period some monks uh, were brought here because they'd refused to swear the oath of allegiance to Henry VIII? That's right. So, so, so we're going to head north now along Giltspur Street. Yeah. And Giltspur Street, as its name suggests, this is where they would um, you know, man- manufacture spurs, gild yep. them. And we're going to head up towards um, Smithfield, uh, which was a huge open space outside the city of London to which cattle would be brought from across the country uh, and to this day, Smithfield is still the major meat market. Um, yeah. it's, it's the only one that, that continues from the Middle Ages um, on, the same, on the same place. Um, but it was also, in medieval times, the site of the great priory of St. Bartholomew. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that when we get to it. Yeah. Um, but yes, so, so um, when, uh, when the priory of St. Bartholomew was closed down, there were about 10 monks that refused to take the oath of allegiance to Henry VIII, and so they were brought to, they were starved, to Newgot they? Jail and, and, and left to starve. Um, and as we will see, there are quite a lot of memorials reaching back to the Tudor period, back even to, to the Middle Ages. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so rich in early modern and medieval monuments is because, of course, back in the city in 1666, you had the Great Fire, which incinerated vast, you know, huge amounts of the medieval city. But Dominic, if you look here as we come down Giltspur Street, you'll see up ahead there is a... Cock Lane. A golden... No, up, up there. It's, oh, yeah. It's a golden statue of a fat boy. This boy is in memory put up for the late fire of London, occasioned by the sin of gluttony, 1666. Yeah. Are you trying so, to tell me something, Tom? <laughs> so so this, this, this golden boy yeah. marks the furthest limit that the Great Fire reached. So it swept through Newgate, up Giltspur Street, and it was stopped here. 
And the, so, the sin of gluttony, is this a reference to sort of Pudding Lane, Baker's Shops? The Boy at Pie Corner was erected to commemorate the staying of the Great Fire, which beginning at Pudding Lane was ascribed to the sin of gluttony when not attributed to the Papists, yeah. as on the monument. And the boy was made prodigiously fat yeah. to enforce the moral. The thing is that by today's standards, he's, he's not, not really actually fat, that is fat. He? No, he looks quite healthy. <laughs> no. Um, he was originally built into the front of a public house called the Fortune of War, which used to occupy this site and was pulled down in 1910. Now, here's an interesting thing, Tom. The Fortune of War was the chief house of call north of the river for resurrectionists in so body, body snatching. snatching. Yeah. In body snatching days years ago, very strangely punctuated to this, in body snatching days years ago, the landlord used to show the room where on benches around the walls the bodies were placed, labelled with the snatchers' names, waiting till the surgeons at St Bartholomew's could run round and appraise them. Right, because the Priory is also a hospital. So right. St Bartholomew's Hospital is another... Yes, um, we were opposite St Bartholomew's Hospital, one of London's most famous hospitals, probably the most famous. Yeah, so... so I think I think this is an absolutely brilliant this this sense that I mean it's again a very anonymous corner apart from yeah. the statue of the fat boy. Uh, you'd have no sense that this is where body snatchers were hanging out. No, no, not at uh, all. But this and is yet actually, this, and yet this is absolutely why this is such an incredibly interesting part yeah. of London to walk around because it's absolutely full of these kind of ghosts. And talking of ghosts, we are on the corner of. Uh, a, a road that is very, very famous to anyone who knows about ghosts and which featured in the, the wonderful episode we did on ghosts, and that is Cock Lane. Right. Now, let's talk about Cock Lane. So, Cock Lane, obviously, uh, that's an allusion to the, 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 the butcher's produce that is here. Right. So, there are still roads, lanes, whatever. Yeah. That, that so, it's kind of a poulterer's lane, I it's suppose. It's a poulterer's lane. Um, so, but, but down there, so Cock Lane was, um, it was a house that in the 18th century, um, 1762, it's probably the most notorious haunting in the whole of London's history. Um, and it's a poltergeist, which claimed to be the ghost of a woman who'd been murdered by a former lodger. And it became the biggest talking point in London. Everyone was talking about yes. it. And people came in and started kind of... Um, Finding we, out. We had Roger Clark, didn't we? We telling had Roger us all Clark about telling us all about that. So if you're interested in the full story of that, go back and Dr. listen Dr. Johnson that. went and investigated it. He did, yeah. Um, not, a, not a great ghost hunter. I think it'd be... Br- I mean, I think we talked then about... Dr. Johnson, what, 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 Yeah. yeah. There's a great TV series in that. And by the way, I thought of it first. If <laughs> yeah. you're, um, <laughs> um, but um, the, sadly for fans of the psychic, it, it basically people decided it, it, it had all been a fraud. Yeah, and actually, um, as streets go, it's a pretty drab and unprepossessing looking street now isn't it but that's the funny thing about this about this corner of london tom there can be very few places in london where there's such a sort of a gulf between the the romantic kind of ghost haunted memory yeah and the frankly slightly banal reality yeah Yeah. And, and and i think that that is exactly what makes london's history so hard to get a grasp on yeah uh it's not like going around rome or even paris um, it's it's not kind of in your face. Yeah. But having said that, because fortunately we're now going beyond the limits of the Great Fire, there are some incredible monuments to Excellent. London's past. I look forward to. So them. I think we should we should head up now towards um, Saint Bartholomew's Priory, um, and Saint Bartholomew's Priory was founded by a man called Rahir, and Rahir was um, a, a leading courtier at the court of Henry the First. So. Um, the younger son of William the Conqueror, um, succeeded William, William II, William Rufus. Uh, and some stories say that Rahir was Henry I's jester. Oh, nice. Um, I'd be wonderful to think that he was. He, um, he went to Rome on pilgrimage, got sick, uh, prayed, and a vision of St. Bartholomew came to him. Uh, he, he got healed, got cured, uh, and he made a vow that he would come back and he would found a priory in a hospital. Uh, and he came back, and Henry I gave him land by Smithfields, so just outside. So outside um, the city. Outside yeah. the city. And again and again, when you look at um, the line of the Roman walls, and you look at where monasteries, priories, abbeys, so on, are situated, they're next to the walls for the obvious reason that the Roman walls provided a vast quantity of building material <laughs> that they yeah. could then put into it. So when the Reformation came... Most of the priory got sold off, although not all of it, as we will see in due course. And um, the monks had run the hospital. And so people in London were kind of very worried that 
uh, they'd be left without the medical services that the monks had been providing at the hospital. And so they petitioned Henry VIII to basically refound it. And so that's exactly what happened. Um, Unless you're one of those monks who you shoved in to starve to death. Yeah, well, that's obviously, that's less good. Now, it's a shame because we're standing in front of the main entrance uh, into St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Yeah. And uh, it's absolutely covered in scaffolding. In, so in Dominic- keeping with the spirit of this, <laughs> yeah, of this exactly, episode. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's kind of, yes, yeah, a wonderful metaphor. I shall have to use my, uh, my prodigious imagination. Or consult the Bodleian. Or consult but the Bodleian. Behind, <laughs> behind, that, behind that scaffolding is um, the only statue of Henry VIII that stands in London. And very and kindly, if you want to have a look at they it, have put a picture of it on the scaffolding. They've put a picture of it. So we've got the fat, the fat golden boy down there, and, and here that, we've got well, the another fat boy, fat, fat Henry VIII. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is Henry VIII in his pomp, isn't it? It's not Henry VIII as Prince Harry; it's Henry VIII as kind of as Johnny Vegas. Yes, this is the um, the enema. Yeah, the enema, the enema stage. stage. <laughs> the ulcer, the ulcer on the leg yeah. stage. So St Bartholomew's Hospital, still a functioning hospital. Yeah. Um, there were people. There were talk of, of closing it down. I think about ten, fifteen years ago, but it's it it carries on. Um, and of course, very famous. Um, this is where Harvey, William Harvey, developed the uh, blood transfusion. Blood transfusion, but also very, very famous for um, the first meeting of the celebrated fictional couple. Of course, Watson, of course, has got back from Afghanistan. Yeah, he is wounded. Yep, um, and and uh, Holmes is in the chemical laboratory. And of a friend, the of course, says, you know, going to know a guy at the hospital who yep. is a little bit eccentric, but yep. uh, he's looking for someone to share rooms. Yeah. And, and they meet here. And I think in the, um, in the, uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch update, yes. this is where he, fall, this is rather than the Reichenbach Falls, he jumps off St. Bartholomew's Hospital as a, as a nice a kind of a tribute. A nod, yes. Yes, as a nod to that. So, um, I, I mean, I think anyone with an interest in, in London's history is glad that the hospital carries on yeah. and, and continues to bear the name of, of St. Bartholomew. Now, the priory, which we, we're now, you know, we're on a street, we're outside the hospital. In medieval times, the priory is, ran where we are walking now. We're on the open street. So we're approaching a, a, a Tudor gatehouse. Yeah. Um, which is, and you can see there's kind of, um, you know, the essence of Tudor architecture. So black beams, white paint. Yes. Um, but there's an archway beneath it, which is actually 13th century. So the Tudor gatehouse was added, obviously, in the Tudor period. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that's top <laughs> history podcasting. And it then, got cu- it then got covered over, and I think it got kind of rediscovered after the Blitz. So um, they, they removed the, the facing and discovered this kind of amazing Yeah, it's doorway. magnificent. Uh, because there's very, very few buildings of that period yeah. in London, right? Yeah, I mean, right. Uh, but we're now going to the surviving chunk of the Priory. So, when the priory, so we're now walking, we're walking through the gateway, and we're walking down a, a pathway, and this was the nave of the priory. So this was the kind of the main body of the church. Yeah. Um, in traditional fashion, there's an incredibly banal office block <laughs> right in the middle of what yes. would have been the centre of the church. <laughs> yes. But, but we're now approaching uh, what, what is now the parish church of St. Bartholomew the Great. Yeah. Which preserves um, a section of, uh, of the original priory. Um, and it, it is the oldest surviving parish church in London. It's a very handsome little church, I think. Very, yeah. very handsome church. And it reaches back to, uh, t- to the Norman period. So it's got so, a brick tower, red brick tower. So the brick tower um, is, is, is later. Yeah. Um, but the, the main body... When we, uh, Have you been here before? Never. Okay, so um, anyone who's seen four weddings and a funeral, this is the, the scene of the final uh, wedding. So it's where Hugh Grant... Jilts, duck face, and oh yeah, goes you know, off. This is a perfect opportunity for you to revive your Hugh Grant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, gosh, uh, ca- <laughs> is it raining? <laughs> oh, that's so moving. <clears throat> and so, when you step inside, yes, suddenly you're you're back in the Middle Ages. You so, are. This is so here is so, so on the right as you go in, you've got um, a section of the cloisters, uh, just to kind of really one of the four sides of the cloisters. But going in here. Suddenly, you are you are in this remarkable space, and it's it's the meeting point. And so you 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 come in, and you basically you're at the interface of the Romanesque, yeah. which is the style of architecture that 
the Norman kings were sponsoring. So there we've got those Romanesque arches and, yeah, and so, arcades and so on. Yeah, so it's kind of narrow, narrow arches, yeah. um, squat arches, squat pillars. And then the place where we're standing, kind of opening up onto that space, you have the Gothic. Yes, and this the is soaring the, arches. Uh, so, so this and um, the chapel in the, in the Tower of London is the earliest manifestations of the Gothic. And it's a kind of incredible, incredible space. And so, so this, you know, this is a church that is going to be 900 years old in 2023. Yeah. Um, and so as you would expect, it is just full of uh, trace elements, memories, memorials to that history. So this, this um, font here dates from 1404. And do you know who was baptized there? There's no reason why you would. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hogarth. Uh, Hogarth, who lived in the area. See, I was going to guess someone from the 15th century because you'd thrown <laughs> me with 1404. So, so Hogarth. So, so Hogarth, yeah. Hogarth was one of the guys who was very sceptical about um, the Cock Lane ghost. So he's very much a guy who was hanging around in this area. Yes. So he's baptised here. Being so, baptised so very much, ghosts. Very much a local. Um, and if we walk down here, um, we come to uh, what I think is, in a way, the most history-haunted single the most single history haunted space in the whole of London because you see we, we, we're, we're going down the side of the uh, round yeah. the pillars so we're, we're heading towards the head the of the of church the altar now. behind the altar and ahead of us is a tiny altar which shows the virgin yeah um, nice with, icon uh, always with, with the baby icon. Jesus now this court this this place here next to the, the icon of the virgin is the only known place to have hosted an appearance by the Virgin Mary in London. Well, so you're going to have to justify that claim, Tom. So she appeared ar around 1180. So yep. after the you know some some kind of uh, what was it? Kind of 70 years, 60 years after the founding of the priory, uh, and she turned up and she spoke to a canon called Hubert, and told him that the monks were doing the liturgy incorrectly. Oh. So basically, she was kind of telling them off. Yes. And she told Hubert what they had to do. In and English? I imagine it was in Or Norman Latin. French. I mean, or, <laughs> yeah, Aramaic. I mean, who knows <laughs> what she was talking. I imagine I'm in asking Latin. too many questions. I, I imagine in Latin. Um, and, so, and so she told Hubert what he had to do, and uh, he obediently did it, and then the, the Virgin Mary vanished. Right. And so in honor of that, they built um, this wonderful chapel, which is attached. It's behind, directly behind the altar, built onto it, the Lady Chapel again, has a kind of huge, great picture of the Virgin behind the altar up here. But this, after the Reformation, this, all, this space all got sold off. Yeah, because, of course, they, they, the reformers would not have been keen. Yeah, so the church got... So, so this got kept as a church, as, to serve as a parish church. But this bit, the Lady Chapel, which was, was built in honour of the appearance of the Virgin Mary, um, that, got, uh, that got sold off. And so it got bought up, it got used, it got turned into private accommodation, it got turned into workshops, um, and... In the 1720s, this was a printer's. And in 1724, yeah. the printer's took on a new assistant. Can I guess who it was? Have a guess. Was it Benjamin Franklin? It was, Dominic. It was. So, so, I so know more this, than you think, Tom. So, so this space <laughs> is the only place yeah. that, ha that, that has appeared, a, a, a visit, you know, that's featured both the Virgin Mary and Benjamin Franklin. And I think, and I think others. Am I not right in thinking that a dancing master was also... Correct. Involved with this space yes. at some point. Did they so, have a so dancing the, school or something? So there was a dancing school here. There was a printer's, all kinds of things. And then... Mr. In, Mr. Mr. Turvydrop, isn't it? From, yeah, that's um, right. from Bleak House. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But the reason, I, the reason I love that is that, as you know, Dominic, I'm a, a great enthusiast for the way that uh, Christian history has shaped the cast you of thought. You astound me. You astound me. Um, and uh, the sense of, of continuity between you know, the age of faith and the Middle Ages and the, the age of the Enlightenment. Yes, of course. Which many people see as being, rad, you know, radical discon discontinuity. Uh, I would see as being very much part of a continuum. And so I think that this, you know, yeah. in terms of spaces that are haunted by the past, the this is... this dancers is a, past. Dancers past. So, so it got brought back by the church in um, the 19th century. Oh, uh, so this is the, the, the chapel on the site now is a, is a sort of... No, this is, this is the authentic... You know, this was... It, it, this space was turned into workshops. Oh, they then got cleared right. out and it got reconsecrated, um, given back to the church. And the roof was, was about to collapse and they had a, an appeal. So they, it opened earlier this year and this of course has been um uh, a church of notable weddings tom has it not well i mentioned um hugh grant 
You did? Uh, Deborah Mitford got married here. So um, all very, very exciting. And there are two kind of interesting other highlights just to, just to point out. What have you got for us, Tom? So up there, there's an oriel window, which is where the, uh, the prior, just before the Reformation, built it so that he could gaze down and check that the monks were behaving themselves. Oh, yeah, that's right. So that's kind of nice. But here is the tomb of Prior Rahir, who founded the, guy the who monastery founded and the hospital. The original Roman yes. pilgrim. Uh, and um, he is, so we talked about how this is a, a, an area of London that is haunted by ghosts. He reputedly literally haunts this church um, because uh, the story goes that um, in the 19th century, the tomb was opened by workmen who, and one of them stole his sandal. And so the ghost of the... It's a strange thing to steal. Very strange, very strange. A relic? No, because he's, um, he's, not, he's not a saint or anything. Why would you want his sandal? Dead man's sandal. I, I, I think simply to set up the story. Right. Because uh, I remember saying, I remember telling this to Roger Clark, and he turned around and said, "Yes, that, that story has appeared in about five hundred iterations." Oh, really? So I, again, I don't think so it's entirely true. Not, but it's very, but, but I mean, it's it's, it's I, lovely, Tom. But it, is that one of those things that sometimes happens in this podcast, where you tell a story that turns out to be totally untrue? Uh, well, it's up, up to the listener to decide whether it's true or not. Okay, uh, I'm not going to say whether Prior hears ghost materialises on the day of his death and I think this demanding the return of his sandal or not just before we go into the break I think this church is featured in lots of films hasn't it should we go and see if there's, a, think, if there's a list uh, well I think there may be a list <laughs> and I'm prepared to bet that this church appeared in Robin Hood Prince of Thieves well it would be astonishing if you're you a fan right. of Robin Hood Prince of Thieves Tom yeah I loved it did you yeah did Kevin Costner didn't annoy you I loved its distinctive geography going from uh, Dover to wherever it was, London, via Hadrian's Wall. Robin Hood films have a, have a, <laughs> a slightly checkered record, don't they? Because I always think of Russell Crowe's accent when he played Robin Hood. So The End of the Affair. Shakespeare in Love. Um, End of the Affair twice, it appears. Elizabeth, The Golden Age. Um, the Sherlock other Holmes. Girl. Snow White and the Huntsman. And The Muppets Most Wanted. Muppets Most Wanted. Well, we're big fans of Avengers them. Age of Ultron. Transformers, The Last Night. We're big fans of The Muppets on this. Uh, yeah, we are. We love The Muppets. Um... So it's always good to have a Muppets-themed episode, and I'm glad to see we've ticked that box. And on that note, I think we'll go to a break, and we should come back after the ads with some more Secrets of London. So welcome back to The Rest is History. Um, we have just left the church. Obviously, it wouldn't have done for us to stay in the church while advertising was taking place. So we, <laughs> we left for the for reasons of decorum. And now Tom has brought us outside to the site of a plaque to somebody who I know is very close to Tom's heart, <laughs> a real hero of Tom's. It's to the immortal memory of Sir William Wallace. That was a very good Scottish accent. That was fantastic. So this is where Mel that, was, that was basically Mel Gibson's Scottish accent. Got hung, drawn and courted. And the reason for that is that we are, you know, we're at Smithfield. And as we said in the first half, this is one of the great open spaces um, abutting the medieval uh, walls, the medieval limits of the city. So um, Smithfield meant smooth field. So yeah. A place where, you know, all the cattle and everyone was bought. We've got the, the meat market over there. But because it was an open space... Um, it could play host to all kinds of gatherings. And there was obviously no more popular excuse what, what for a better, gathering, what better gathering? Than, than to watch uh, a rebel against uh, his uh, anointed liege lord be tortured to death, but Tom, which is, which is what the, happened here with you William Wallace. Caption? You didn't write this caption, that's for sure. Scottish patriot born at Eldersley Renfrewshire, circa 1270 AD, who from the year 1296 fought dauntlessly in defence of his country's liberty and independence in the face of fearful odds and great hardship, eventually being betrayed and brought to London, blah, 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 put to death. His hero example, heroism and devotion inspired those who came after him to win victory from defeat, and his memory remains for all time a source of pride, honour, an inspiration to his countrymen. Yeah. That was Mel Gibson again. Yeah, that, um, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, Tom, you would not approve of that. I could, would completely approve of it because the, the great cult of William Wallace, the, the idea of him as a, a great patriotic defender of Scottish independence, yeah. was a product of, um, of, of the Union. Uh, it was Scots who were confident in right. their British identity, but who nevertheless were you know, interested to... 
But isn't to it conserve the flame of a great Scottish history, put up. a great Scottish hero. Now, if you look closely, there's a smaller plaque. This memorial was placed here by Scots and friends at home and abroad by kind position of the governor's St Bartholomew's Hospital, 1956. So, so, so uh, not an age of, of kind of rampant Scottish nationalism. No, but just before the revival, I yeah, suppose, of but, Scottish but, nationalism. And there are still some very desultory. There's some a few flowers here. A little yeah. card there. That's from Rod Stewart. Uh, there's a thistle. <laughs> or Alex Salmon, I think. Uh, Scottish flags. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, so, so essentially, traitors to the king would. You know, this is one of the places where you would come to watch a, a good, um, a good, a, hanging, a good hanging, and yeah. drawing, and and, and quartering. Um, and uh, it, it, so, so the guts would then join all the guts from the butchers. Um, so, uh, and they would then be swept into the River Fleet, which is over there, which we right. may come to in, a, in, a, in due course. So the, the, the stench of this was the kind of overpowering the stench of in the Wallace. Middle Ages. And actually, um, you know, among the ghosts that haunt this place are literary ghosts, ghosts from, from, from fiction. And one of them is Pip. In Great Expectations, Expectations. by uh, by Charles Dickens, um, who, when he comes to London, goes to the offices of Mr. Jaggers, of the uh, the lawyer who has been entrusted with his you know the legal details of his his inheritance, his Great Expectations, and it's just down there, just the side corner, so between the the hospital and the church, there's a side alley called Little Britain. And that's where he had his offices. And Dickens says that Pip comes here from the country and he walks up towards Jaggers' office and the stench from the, uh, from the meat market kind of makes him almost faint. Well, the so, market is still here. I mean, the we're within still there. the market. But, but there uh, isn't no the kind of stench. There's no, no stench. But so, um, so uh, disembowelings happened here, uh, but other things happened as well. And among the things that happened here, um, people would congregate for, for great kind of festive occasions, great social occasions. Of which the preeminent one was St. Bartholomew's Fair. Yes, which was very famous. Very, very famous. Um, established by the Priory in 1123. Um, site of, uh, you, you'd have tournaments here as well. So um, there, was, and, yeah, there was a famous tournament lots. under um, Richard II that Chaucer played a, a key role in organising. But you would also have meetings that weren't necessarily sanctioned by the Crown. Yeah. And the most famous of those is when the peasants who were embroiled in the peasants' revolt, marching on London, they all congregated here. They did indeed, didn't they? This is the, isn't this the showdown? This is the showdown, uh, um, and led by Watt Tyler. Yeah. And Watt Tyler gets struck down here by the Lord Mayor of London. He does, yes, uh, because he doesn't show enough deference to yeah. Richard II. And, and so it's... Um, it's uh, so there's a, new, a, a very new plaque here. Well, so, so it's, it's, it's a, a plaque raised to the memory of, of um, the peasants who, who took place, who took part yeah. in, in, the, uh, in the revolt. Yeah, what well, some people might consider classic sort of radical tradition. It's been placed slightly too high, so you can't really <laughs> yes. read what's at the... Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what's the so the memory is already, is already fading. The, the William Wallace one is much clearer. Yeah. But there's something here, uh, blah, 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 what's it say? It's <laughs> something about and the plight yeah. of the people. This, this, uh, is, this is a terrible metaphor <laughs> yeah, for the, uh, the plight of the British left, <laughs> yeah. I think. The, the, um, but it's very you, hard to see what's there's a, So there. there's a mention of what Tyler being killed here yeah. and of uh, John Ball, who preached the, uh, you know, when Adam... Eve, when Adam, Adam delved, delved in Eve's span. span, who then was the gentleman. Yeah. Um, so this so was unveiled by um, Ken Loach, among other people. Um, and there's a quote here from Thomas Paine on a plaque. If the barons merited a monument to be erected at Runnymede, that's a reference to Magna Carta, Tyler merited one in Smithfield, Thomas Paine, 1791. Of course, the great thing about this is it's all a kind of invent, like Magna Carta, it's kind of an invention, isn't it? The Peasants' Revolt isn't a kind of proto-socialist uprising, really. Um, but it's become part of that kind of invented radical tradition, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, and, and that, again, absolutely is part of the fascination of London's history. Yeah. Is that the memories of what happened here don't have to be accurate no. for them themselves in turn to become part of history, part I think, of the flow uh, of it. Jeremy Corbyn has been here, Tom. I, I would like to do a little well, pilgrimage it, in the footsteps of Corbyn. <laughs> well, well, you know, there's, there's something for all tastes here. So there's something for Scottish nationalists, there's something for members of Momentum, <laughs> uh, and there's something for radical Protestants. Because oh, um, here there is a third memorial, yeah. uh, which was erected 1870 by the Protestant Alliance so that's in sort of London. That's evangelical group, I, I, I guess imagine. so. Uh, and that commemorates the, um, so we've had disembowelings, uh, yep. but 
most notoriously on the reign of Queen Mary, yes. there were the burning of heretics. Um, so the burnings that took place here are essentially what gave Mary the first her nickname of Bloody, Bloody Mary. Mary. Um, and the great theme of Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, this sense that um, the revival of Catholicism would mean Protestants being burnt in Smithfield yep. uh, haunted the imaginings of, of uh, Protestants throughout the late 16th, so 17th century. Within a few feet of this spot, says the memorial, John Rogers, John Bradford, John Philpott and other servants of God suffered death by fire for the faith of Christ in the years 1555, 1556, 1557. Now, of course, since we were revisionist about the Peasants' Revolt, we should also be a little bit revisionist about uh, Bloody Mary, who gets a bit of a bad press, doesn't she? Because... Um, you know, burning heretics was hardly unusual behaviour in the uh, 16th century. And uh, some people would argue she was just unlucky in her, rep in her posthumous reputation. Yeah, Why I mean, had she, had she lived a bit longer, yeah. um, uh, I'm and sure. And had Catholicism His become enshrined, yeah. once again, no one would say it was... History would remember it very differently. Know, yeah. um, just where we're standing, um, in 1849, um, some workmen were digging a sewer... As they were digging it, they found um, a mass of blackened stones, and these, it was claimed, were covered with ashes and human bones, charred and partially consumed. And an antiquary came to inspect it and had absolutely no doubt that he was gazing at the remnants of the incinerated Protestant well, martyrs. all those years later? <sighs> Again, Dominic, you're... <laughs> I'm much you too and your, sceptical. You and your scepticism towards yeah. these wonderful stories. Uh, uh, th there's one on, on the subject of um, horrendous occasions from the past that commemorate in open spaces. There's one other. We won't go and look at it now because we haven't really got time. Um, but around the corner fr on, the, on the other side of, of uh, the meat market, there's an open space, uh, Charterhouse Green, yeah. which was originally uh, a plague pit in, during the Black Death. So they were developing the tube line and they discovered all the, the bones came tumbling mm. out um, and uh, Charterhouse Green subsequently there was a, a priory was founded there Carthusians um, and uh, again in the Reformation all got sold off became a famous school that then moved out one of the more famous ah, private schools isn't it so Charterhouse I don't know where it went but is it Surry. Surrey Godalming Godalming okay um, I have an encyclopedic knowledge of public <laughs> schools well very very impressive someone has to so <laughs> So, so essentially, I mean, this, you know, the, the sense of history here is kind of almost oppressive. And unless you knew to look to go through that gate yard, to go into St. Yes. Bartholomew the Great, to, to, to know what happened in St. Bartholomew's Hospital, and certainly to know what happened in this open space. That's what Tyler, though, William Tom. Wallace, It's the combination of martyrs. the banality of the modern day landscape with the layering of, frankly, a very bloody and violent history isn't it yeah that, you know people are bustling well they're not even bustling about actually a few people are sort of trudging in a slightly disconsolate way past the, at the end of the day from their yeah. office on their way yeah. to the commute home and and the memories are preserved in the the street yeah, name cloth so we're going fair. past, we're cloth, past fair cloth fair now fair. yeah there's one last place i'd like to okay but to take you to. do you think i mean probably there's never been a point in the history of this part of london where it has been quieter and more desultory than it is now do you think i for think that's so true. much of its history there's yeah. a bustling yeah you know it would have been maybe the analogy is if you were to visit a city like i don't know delhi or istanbul or something crowded you know rich and poor jumbled up together uh hawkers in the streets yes yeah. pickpockets yeah a with real the, and with the prospect of, of, of a good execution <laughs> yes uh, so, yeah. I mean, there's no prospect of that now. No. So, so in many ways, London has gone downhill. I think it's less interesting. Um, but that's precisely what history podcasts are for. To bring back the spirit to of bring, the, to, to conjure up, the... Yeah, to conjure up the vanished ghosts. Yeah. Um, and actually, what gives you a very good sense of just how horrible uh, this, this place would have been is that we... So we're now walking parallel to the, the great Victorian structure of the, uh, of the meat market... Um, away from the open space where the burnings and the disembowelings happened. Um, and we're, we're, we're going downhill. And the reason that we're going downhill is that we're plunging into a river valley. And the river that we're heading towards is the River Fleet. So that is now, 
For those people who don't know, the Fleet is probably the most famous, isn't it, of London's vanished rivers. So the Fleet gives its name to Fleet Street, which is obviously so probably Fleet, not anymore, yeah. but for, for certainly when we were growing up, was synonymous with newspapers. Um, and when did the Fleet vanish, Tom? Well, it's, it's, so it starts to get covered over um, 17th, 18th, as late as the 19th century, you could still sail up... Um, a section of the fleet but the value of the fleet and one of the other reasons why the meat market is here is that you could sweep the carcasses you know so all the guts that you've hacked out yeah. when you're when you're you're doing your joints you could just sweep it into the into the river so, um, some listeners may remember we had a podcast about disease with kyle harper and he was talking about you know cholera and dysentery and all these things and he would not be impressed no, by the, would, uh, the by the standards, standards of hygiene. No, no. well, and there's, um, there are three very famous lines by Jonathan Swift, who wrote about the fleet, sweepings from butchers' stalls, dung, guts, and blood, drowned puppies, stinking sprats, all drenched in mud, <laughs> dead cats, and turnip tops come tumbling down the flood. Well, anyway, this podcast is sponsored <laughs> by the London Tourist Board. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, there's no evidence of that right now. <laughs> so, um, so the fleet was was by this this stage was a you know until it got covered over was quite broad. So Fleet Street, where it uh, it crosses the the River Fleet just in front of St Paul's Cathedral, Ludgate yeah. Hill, that was a ford. So that that was the the reason it's called Fleet Street is because you could cross the fleet there. Right. Um, but it all got covered over. And you remember we started this episode on Hoban Viaduct. We did indeed. And the viaduct is basically built over the river valley of the fleet. And the fleet marks um, one of the kind of, the, you know, one, one of the, uh, the, the urban boundaries. And it's on the other side of the fleet. I just want to show you one last, one last kind of place of horror. Ah, oh, Tom, um, you lure me up to London with these uh, <laughs> but tales I think, uh, of... But I think you'll enjoy it because it's, it's a fictional place of horror. Right. Very uh, good. And we've already mentioned... I like any place of horror, factual or fictional, to be honest with you. We've already mentioned the novelist who created this fictional place of horror. Oh, excellent. And it is, of course, Charles Dickens. And the place that we're heading towards is the place where the young Oliver Twist, when he comes to London gets picked up by please the sir. artful dodger. Please, sir, I want some more. Um, Is that what people will be saying at the end of this podcast, Tom? I certainly hope so. And he gets, ta- and he gets taken by the artful dodger um, to, uh, to visit a pleasant old gentleman and his hopeful pupils. And, of course, the, uh, the pleasant old gentleman is Fagin and the hopeful pupils are the pickpockets. So um, we're coming down now to... Well, it's now a major road, but it the river fleet runs beneath it and we cross we cross there um, and then we will come to um, Saffron Hill you're, ne- you're never happier <laughs> listeners to our Christmas Carol podcast will know that you're never happier than when bringing us to the dingiest dreariest yeah. spot imaginable and we're coming down some steps here and there's coming a th- stream of dog urine yeah <laughs> there's, a, there's a DHL van dri- dripping down the um, steps we're at the back um, of some sort of loading bay yeah. it's the most unromantic <laughs> corner of London you could possibly okay. imagine so this is Saffron Hill um, which definitely it, does not live up to its uh, name. Well, so, so this was all part of the, the uh, owned by the Bishop of Ely. So you remember in our Richard the Third episode, um, we talked about how Richard of Gloucester, before be- having be- Hastings beheaded, asked the Bishop of Ely for strawberries from his garden. He did indeed. Yes. So, the, so the Bishop of Ely's garden was kind of uh, uh, in this neighbourhood, um, and it's uh, Saffron Hill because saffron grew here. Now, as you say. There's no trace of saffron now. No. Yeah, so we kind of very. It's it's very narrow. There are very high buildings on either side. Blank it's, buildings. Yeah, I wouldn't bring of, people sightseeing here. Kind of gloomy and miserable. But this is this is where Fagin's lair was, um, and I know that you're a, a big Dickens fan. So um, perhaps you have. I have a little reading here. Perhaps you have a little reading that you'd like you to share with the You readers. didn't expect that. Um, but, well, actually you did, because you put it in the notes. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, here we go. Oliver could not help bestowing a few hasty glances on the other side of the way as he passed along. A dirtier or more wretched place he had never seen. The street was very narrow and muddy, and the air was impregnated with filthy odours. They've played quite a considerable part in this episode. 
There were a good many small shops, but the only stock in trade appeared to be heaps of children, who even at that time of night were crawling in and out of the doors or screaming from the inside. The sole places that seemed to prosper amid the general blight of the place were the public houses, and in them, Tom Holland, the lowest orders of Irish, who were generally the lowest orders of anything, were wrangling with might and main. I hope my wife isn't listening to this. Covered ways and yards, which here and there diverged from the main street, disclosed little knots of houses where drunken men and women were positively wallowing in the filth. And from several of the doorways, great ill-looking fellows were cautiously emerging, bound to all appearance upon no very well-disposed or harmless errands. Yes. So there we uh, are. And so you mentioned the, the, uh, the taverns. Uh, and one last link with Oliver Twist is ahead of us, there's a pub that is now called the One Ton, but Dickens knew as the Three Cripples. The Three Cripples. You wouldn't get away um, with that. Man. And uh, that, that, that's Fagin and Bill Sykes' is local. So that's where they... Uh, and there's some sort of lightly looking Bill Sykes figures. Yes. Lurking outside the pub. Yes, there are <laughs> dogs on... <laughs> I'm buying a twine, yeah. plotting break-ins. In. Um, so I hope you agree, Dominic, that uh, although there may not be a huge amount to see, it is... Well, a, there's nothing it, to see, Tom. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean. well there's, a, there's a tavern, but I mean, it's once you know yeah, once that you this know. is Fagin's lair... You have it to has know. A, and a there's a message here I think you have for the listeners, Tom. They should venture out and dig up the layers of history beneath even the most unprepossessing neighbourhood. Well, the thing is that, that it's true of London, it's, it's true of lots of places. Of Stevenage, <laughs> of Slough. <laughs> Maybe not of Slough, but of, of, of lots, of, lots of, of places that, um, you know, obviously the more you know of what goes on, yeah. the more you have a sense of the past oozing up out of the tarmac, out of the brickwork. Like the bowels of some dismembered <laughs> Scot. Indeed. <laughs> well, Flung <laughs> into the fleet. Well, on that note... Wash away with the I dead think, dogs. I think it's <laughs> just about beginning to rain. So, on that note, I think we should say farewell to our listeners. Yes. And we will see you next time, a Tom. farewell from London Town. Fancy a quick pint? Yeah, let's go.